If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me to Revelation 11. Ooh, Revelation. I love it, I love it. Revelation chapter 11. We'll continue where we was last week. All right, so last week we, we introduced in our study of uh, end times, we introduced the two witnesses and put the... Uh, Maybe put some, some gears going in your head and thinking about some things and so well, who are these guys? And everybody everybody ponders and everybody wonders, well, who who are the two witnesses? And some of y'all probably have it made up in your mind already who those two witnesses are. Who could they be? I don't know. And and I can tell you who I think they are, but uh, then it'd be kind of defeating the point. That thing's blowing my fingers. I would like for you to dig and even pray about God. What are you? What are you? What are you trying to tell us? What are you trying to teach us from from this instance that's found in, in Revelation 11 that uh, precedes Christ's second coming? You now, what is it that you need me to know? What is it that we need to prepare prepare for? And we we've talked about that so many times about. It, it's not, I mean, a lot of us, we want to be, we want to live long enough to see Jesus and meet him in the air, right? That, that, oh, does it get any better than that? I don't know. I, I don't know that it would get much better than that, than that moment, that every, every ounce of hair just goes right away and say, here he is, the one I've been searching for, the one I've been running after, the one I've been longing for all my life, or all my born again life. There he is what I've been waiting for. And and I think it, that, that shock and awe doesn't stop on that first day that you see him, that first instance. I think it just continues to grow and to grow and to grow and say, what well, this is the one I sought to know and now I see him face to face. Amen? That's what we're looking for. So in this in this of the, of the two witnesses, I'm, I'm going to back up and, and say that what some people, kind of going over a little bit what we last did last night. Some people believe that uh, the two witnesses are, are Enoch and Elijah. Why Enoch and Elijah? Because Enoch walked with God and God took him. He, it, it says he did not die, right? Elijah, what happened? Carried up in a chariot of fire by a whirlwind and did not die. And they propose that that's why he's one of the two witnesses here. Because neither one of those fellows died. And and in Hebrews, we see the scripture says it's appointed that a man wants to die and then the judgment. So everybody's got to die. Yeah, Lazarus, he was raised from the dead, but what? He had to die. You know, he, he's not still roaming around somewhere. He had to die. Uh, the, the, out of the four people Jesus raised from the dead, they, they all died. They're all gone, right? And scripture says the point of the man wants to die, so they prepared they proposed that these two guys, maybe Enoch and Elijah, because they never die. So God preserved them for a certain time to come back and be these two witnesses. The problem with these with these uh, in this chapter eleven, it never says these are two men that never died before. It, it's not in there. You don't see that. It's, it doesn't say that. But you have to assume that that's what it says because probably that's what you're taught, right? So some people believe it's Enoch and Elijah. Some people believe it may be Elijah and Moses. Why do they believe it's Moses? Well, of course, because because Mo, what Moses it says right there that these these guys have power to stop the rain for three and a half years and to cause the waters to turn to blood. Well, who did that? Well, it was Moses, right? And wrong answer. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Moses. Who 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 was it that threw? The staff down and it turned to a snake before the Aaron. Who was it that dipped his rod in the in the river and it turned to blood? Aaron. I hope you learned something. Good job, guys. It wasn't Moses that did that. It was Aaron. So if you suppose that one of the witnesses had to be Moses because he turned the rivers to blood, well, it wasn't Moses that did that. It was it was Aaron. So Moses was out of the picture there. So then other people suppose that it. That it's uh, that maybe it's a type and a shadow. It's a, it's not literal. It's figurative. So these are. Uh, it could be the old and new covenants, right? The uh, the uh, 
the deceived Mormons believe that it's the, the, the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price. That's the two witnesses. That's not it either, by a long shot. Some people believe it's a type of shadow, one's U.S. and the other's Israel. Some believe it's Gentiles and Jews. Others believe it could be the kings and priests represented. I say, y'all need to make up your own mind and don't believe what others tell you. Go to Scripture and let the Scripture decide for itself who these two might be. Amen. And, and why does it matter? Why does it matter? For one, don't be deceived. Because for every real, Satan has a counterfeit, right? So don't be deceived. And for two, the Bible explicitly tells you to study, to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So it's your responsibility to study. Your responsibility to seek God and find it out for, for yourself. It's my responsibility to put a little salt on your tongue. And, oh, i got to study that some more. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. I say you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink. But you can sure salt his tongue, right? So that's, that's what I'm supposing and hoping to do with this. And probably more of a lesson today than, than any preaching. Everybody says amen. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in that, we want to go back to, to Revelation 11. And I'm going to start with verse 1. Well, back up. Back up. Chapter 10, verse 11, which I believe is a key verse that we all need to keep in mind when studying this particular subject. In uh, chapter 10, verse 11, and this angel spake unto John, he said, and in verse 11, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. He tells that to John, and then we go right into chapter 11. You know, you know, men put that little chapter break in there. But it goes right into chapter 11 and verse 1 of chapter 11. And we talked about last night how, how this, where John is given a reed to, and a rod to measure the temple and don't measure the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. And we see the parallel in Ezekiel. Ezekiel's talking, is taken up to heaven in a vision and is talking to a man that has a rod and he's measuring the temple, and for some reason he doesn't measure, measure the outer court. I perceive you're talking to the same people. It's stepping outside the bounds of time, and God lets these two meet. So beyond that, so verse 1, There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So the Gentiles will tread the holy city, which is Jerusalem, forty-two months. That is how long? Three and a half years. Good job, guys. And then verse 3. Here we go. This is where we want to get to. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. What does, what does it mean to be a witness for God? Just on a side note there. Well, I, I have jury duty Monday morning. Yay! <laughs> I already have plans. Why don't they schedule that when I don't have plans? I don't know. But uh, I, so, so I get to go to jury, be sit on a jury and get to hear witnesses. Right? There's somebody that, that is standing and proclaiming that they saw, witnessed, experienced, something and re retelling what it is that they experience. So these, these two witnesses, and the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I mean, so you got to have backup. Jesus said, my backup is, is my Father. So that's two witnesses, me and my Father. That's why we, we don't go by uh, oneness, because he had, had to have two witnesses, and then he had the Holy Spirit as well. So there's two witnesses, give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Right? What is a thousand two hundred and three score days? One thousand two hundred and sixty, which is three and a half years. There, there we go. You'll see that over and over and over and over and over again. And it's very important. So they're going to prophesy in sackcloth. Sackcloth is a sign of mourning and repentance. And 
unto, and they're in the, the, that city. And uh, then verse 4. This is where I want to get to. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, they must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heavens, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them into blood, and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And then it goes about telling about how these two die. Right? That beast that rises up out of the pit apparently is the only thing that has power to kill them and for a purpose and for a reason because God said in, in how, how long before they raise again? Three and a half days God raises them back, back up and says come on up here your job's done. And they, they raise up to heaven in a cloud which we studied about that a few weeks ago. So, so in this I want to back up to verse 4. Be a little, little Bible detectives, okay? I, I'm going to share with you a glimpse of kind of how I study and how words just jump off at me and how I see things that just, it just blows my mind sometimes, right? So in, in this, it says, verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So in, the, in that I see, as a, as a de detective, get out your little magnifying glass, in that I, I see three solid clues that God gives us as to possibly the identity of these two. Or even maybe to see similarities throughout Scripture that may add to more clues about who these two may be. Because I believe it matters. Because if God, if the Holy Spirit gives you an unction, say, ooh, look at that, ooh, look at that, ooh, look at that, then, then you should look at that. And you should dig into that, right? Amen? Uh, you say, or you can say, uh, no, I ain't got time. I ain't got time, God. And you may never get that, that little chunk of steak back. That's like you know, the Word of God that you chew on. If you, if you do that, you may never get that chunk of steak back. You know, I think when, when God gives you something, like, I need to write it down. You know, because I think it's important when God shows you things like that. And the whole, through the whole what are the three clues that we see in verse 4? Right? Two olive trees, two candlesticks, and what else? Standing before the God of the earth. Amen? Wow. That's, that's pretty good clues. If, if, if you find something that, that fits those three clues, then you found something. Right? It's, it's a pretty cool thing. So let's take a look at the first thing, the two olive trees. Two olive trees. Now go back to, hold your spot, go to Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4. We went over a little bit of this last week. And uh, in, in Bible study, at, uh, where did we go Bible study? Lafayette. Lafayette? No. no, we went to Los Leones. Los Leones. Woo, that was good stuff. But, uh, but we, we were studying in Bible study Wednesday morning at breakfast about the, the candlestick, the, the, the menorah of God. The, and Because we, we were in Revelation 1 and it talks about the, the seven churches are candlesticks and Jesus, the Son of, Son of God, is in the midst of them. And so what, what an amazing picture that that painted for us. So we looked at everything in the scripture that had to do with those, those candlesticks. You know, and how they are arranged in the tabernacle, how they are in the temple and and you know, I think it was full of a lot of aha moments. You know, it was like God just smacks you on the forehead. It's like, oh, I get it. I understand. You know, it, 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 it's pretty great. So if you miss the Bible study, next week we're going to be at Laferia Cafe, Wednesday, 9 a.m. We're still in Revelation 1. We're going to start looking at how it describes the Son of God, Jesus. Amen? So... In uh, Zechariah 4, he starts off, an angel talked with me and came again and walked with me as a man that waked out of his sleep, or waking me. And verse 2, and he said to me, what seest thou? And I said, I looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it. And his, his 
seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are on top thereof. It's, it's, a, it's painting a, a description and a picture for you to know and to understand. What, what does this look like? And then verse 3. And two what? Two olive trees by it. One upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left side of the bowl. What, what is one of the scriptures, the definers of the two witnesses? Well, the, the first one, these are the two olive trees and the candlesticks that stand before the God of the earth. This one says, these are two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, one on the left side thereof. So, and then he goes on, talk, he had a conversation with this angel and talking to Jerubabel, and, and then he goes on to verse 11, because he didn't really answer his question. In verse 11, then I answered, I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said to him, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Sound familiar to you? We got two witnesses, two olive trees, two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That's why I, when I when I when I go through Scripture and I see something happen once in Scripture, you know what the the, the chances are that it happens somewhere else, or it's described in the same way in a different place, because that that staple in Scripture in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So here we have two anointed ones, two olive trees, standing by the Lord of the earth on each side. So turn with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings, let's look at another one. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 23. Give you just a second. I love the sound of rice paper in the morning. Better than coffee. <laughs> Get your blood flowing. Get your brain working. Get your spirit energized. That's, a, that's the best way to start your day. Better than vultures in your cup. All right, 1 Kings chapter 6, start with verse 23. And this, this is describing what Solomon is told to build. Well, David to Solomon is told to build in the temple. You know, it started out in the tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant and all the articles that are in there. And now it's to the temple. And how is he building this? And then verse 23, he's telling him, Within the oracle, that's the inner sanctum, the holy of holies. Within the oracle, he made two cherubims of olive tree. What did he make them of? Olive tree, right? Didn't say of olive tree wood. It says made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. How how high is that? It's about fifteen to sixteen foot, depending on your the length of your cubit. You know. My cubit is longer than some people's cubit. You know, that's from the tip of your elbow to the end of your hand, the end of your fingers. So, some's bigger than others. 15 to 16, 16 foot tall. That's a that's a pretty good uh, thing to build there. 10, 10 cubits high. Verse 24, and five cubits was the one wing of one cherub, and five cubits of the other wing of the cherub. And the, from the uttermost part of one wing to the uttermost parts of the other wing were ten cubits. So they're, they're high, how tall? They're ten cubits high, and their wingspan is ten cubits wide. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty amazing thing. And then verse 25, And the other cherub was ten cubits, so there's two of them. The other cherub was ten cubits, and both cherubim were of one measure on one size. And the height of one cherub was ten cubits, and so was it the other cherub. And he set the cherubim within the inner house, and they stretched forth their wings of the cherubim. So the one wing touched one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. And he overlaid, he overlaid the cherubims with gold. 
So you got two cherubim. Cherub is singular. Cherubim is plural. Two cherubim carved out of a olive tree and then covered in gold. Right? You know, there's two types of angels that have wings. Cherubim and seraphim. Seraphim have six wings, as Scripture says. The cherubim have two wings, just the two. Right? Kind of where we get the, the picture. Now, this is nothing like the, the cute little Valentine's cherub that we see. Nothing, there, no, no similarities. That, that idea of that winged cherub, that comes from Greek mythology, not from the Bible. Right? If you understand, that's Greek mythology. That's where you get Zeus and all that other stuff. And, but this is based on Holy Scripture. This is truth. That's a fairy tale. Right? So if you, if you want a concept of what an angel looks like, look to the Bible and don't look to fairy tales. Amen? So, so this paints a picture for you of what these two olive trees are doing in the ark or in the, in the tabernacle. Can you throw the picture up? I found a really good picture. Really good picture. Woo! Now can you imagine the magnitude and the size so what, what dwelt in the center there? So that's the throne. That's the mercy seat. That's, and, and you see throughout Scripture, I think 12 times, that's where the voice of God comes from. In the middle there. The Ark of the Covenant. The tabernacle. And these, these two winged olive trees standing on either side. All powerful. Right? And in this picture... Is they have more than one wing, set of wings. But the cherubim in Scripture only have one set, outstretched, not not more than one. And when 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 they're building the uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the same thing is on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. So you got all this surrounding you, and then you, if you continue to look at all the description, you see on on the walls inside the Holy of Holies was the cherubim standing guard on the door and the veil and the curtains it says there's cherubim everywhere you look there's cherubim everywhere you look they, they put cherubim everywhere but these two specifically are standing guard over the throne of god amen and if if we uh if we look through scripture say in hebrews hebrews 9 it says everything that they created for the tabernacle and for the and for the temple was all made after a pattern of what is in heaven. Moses goes up with the, with the elders and he sees the throne room and then when he when he comes back down he says build the tabernacle after the pattern that I, that you saw up there which I showed you. So he built everything like he showed him and then the same thing with the temple. So build everything after the, the pattern of what you see. So then we see these, these two standing there. What's the clues? Olive tree, candlesticks, standing before the Lord of the earth. Pretty interesting. Okay. Do, you, do you find that it's a, it's a similarity or it's just odd? Do, am, I, am I nuts? Well. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm nuts, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. That's what it is. So, so, so let's look again. Look again at something interesting. Okay. Turn with me to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Because I know for, for time's sake, it would take me a long time to go through everything and all my notes that I've got on these two witnesses. To me, I thought that was pretty profound. Never seen it before. Read the Bible umpteen times over and never see, hey, there's a similarity. There's things repeated all throughout Scripture. Now something else I, I want to show you in Scripture. In, uh, some of y'all heard this before. When the, when the Bible says the word angel, angelos is the Greek word for angel, what, what does that mean? What does it mean? The, Right. Does it mean one of these things that float around on clouds and everything else? No. The, the word means a messenger. And how do we know that? 
Well, I'm going to show you how we know that. It's not necessarily, you have to be discerning. You have to study to show yourself approved. You have to see what is it that God wants to show us in Revelation 19, verse 10. And he said, this John said, and I said, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John falls down to worship what he is speaking to, which is an angel. We see it's an angel. from Re It starts in Revelation 17, 1. This angel, which is one of the ones that hold the vial, he's having this conversation with John and taking him and showing him all these amazing things. And in this, at this point, John is overwhelmed and he falls down to worship this angel. And what does he say? Don't do it. Don't do it. What, what, what angel would say, it's okay, you can worship me. It's okay. No. Satan is the only angel that would say that, right? You know, Satan was, was an angel. He's the only one that would say that. But this, this one here, this, this angel that is, that is showing John all these amazing things, and I, I call it the, the, the God's holy movie theater. He takes him and he shows him this, and he takes him to another multiplex theater and shows him this, takes him to another theater and shows him this, and then shows him this, and then backs up and, and shows him that. All different perspectives. But he says unto him, See thou doest not, and it says, Why? He says, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So you, now you could say, you say, Well, that's that's just an angel saying, Don't worship me. Right? So so turn up to uh, uh, tw chapter 21, verse 9. 21 verse 9, there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. So this starts a new conversation with a different angel, and he says, What, word that, what angel is this? It's one of the seven that are pretty important. He said, Come, come with me, and I'll show you some things. And then what happens when we get up to Revelation 22? Verse 8, Revelation 22, verse 8, it says, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down before to the feet of the angel which showed me these things. He, found, he does it again. I, I don't know about you, but how, how hard-headed can some of us be? Yeah, amen, that's my wife. She'll tell you all about it. Amen. <laughs> we can be hard-headed. So John, John, just just a chapter before, is already told, you don't fall down and worship these things. And then he does it again. Kind of reminded me of something Peter would do. You know? But he said, he said, he fell out of the feet of the angel which showed me these things. In verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy fellow brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. So you have all kinds of clues about who this guy is. John calls him an angel. But why is he? He says he's a fellow servant. And he's of thy brethren the prophets. And they have the testimony of Jesus. Is this a man or is this one of them winged beast things? It's a man. He's a fellow brethren. And, and John never says, hey, well, okay, he introduced himself. I guess this is Ezekiel, you know, he was talking to. What, what it may be. Ezekiel was a prophet. He's a brethren. You know, it, it could be he was talking to Paul. And he doesn't say. John never mentions one person by, by name besides Jesus that he meets in heaven and has a conversation with him. So, so that in that to prove the point that not everything that is called an angel in heaven is one of those things. Amen? Amen. So, so we have the, the two olive trees. 
10 cubits by 10 cubits and well that, that, that measurement should sound familiar to us as well and then you go down to the, the ones that stand before God we looked at that in, in Zechariah 4.14 and then another interesting clue is that God of the earth you know God never stopped being God of the earth right God, he's, he is God of all things and he continues to be God of all things whether some people think he's God or not he's still God their, their belief doesn't stop him from being God right amen so in, in three places it said Genesis 24 3 Isaiah 54 5 and then in, in Revelation 11 it says he is the God of the earth right never stop being God of the earth and then first first Kings 17 first Kings 17 1 another good clue y'all hanging in with me am I going too fast Sheila usually does this number if you're going over their head put a stop to it you know so they catch it first, first Kings 17 if, if you have not read throughout Scripture about this amazing character in there Elijah and you're missing out. What an amazing, I mean, not just a story, it's true. It was a guy, Elijah the Tishbite. But you read how God used him, even in his weakness, because he got scared and ran and hid. You know, how many of us have ever been scared before? You know, you used to have a shirt that says, I ain't scared. <laughs> but all, all of us have been scared before. But in, uh, in 1 Kings 17, verse 1, is the introduction of this, this character, Elijah, that we find in Scripture. And Elijah, verse 1, the Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now we know from Scripture a lot of people presume Elijah is one of the two witnesses because he was carried up in a whirlwind. But here's another clue that may give you some points towards Elijah's favor. He said he, he's telling Ahab who he is. And Ahab already knows. He says, before the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. There shall not be dew nor rain in these years, but according to my word. What, what is the clue? The, the similarities. The witnesses, they have power during the years of their prophecy, three and a half years, they did not rain upon the earth. How long did Elijah say it not rain upon the earth and it didn't rain? How long? Three and a half years. The exact same thing. Right? One of, the, one of the clues to looking at the, the two witnesses, one of the clues that says, and they stand before the Lord of all the earth. Right? What does Elijah say about himself here? The Lord God of Israel, before whom I stand. Now, now you can say, well, that's just, you know, that's just, eh, whatever, whatever. I think it's a pretty good clue. Pretty good similarities. Now, how many people in the Bible did they say that they stand before the Lord of all the earth? There's a few. There, there's a few. And uh, just look down the list. So there's, uh, there's Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Zechariah says that Joshua stands before the Lord of all the earth. Right? So, so and that's, that's not a lot considering the whole of Scripture. There's only a few that say that. And, and then in 1 Kings 18, 15, 18, verse 15, Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will stir, surely show myself unto him this day. Elijah sounds so nice, he says it twice. Right? He says, Before whom I stand. Now, right now, what am I doing? I'm standing. God is everywhere at all times, omnipresent, and am I standing before the God of all the earth? Yes. Elijah says twice, and I think it's a pretty good clue, that he's standing before the Lord of all the earth. And then, so then, what two clues fit Elijah? 
You have the cannot rain for three and a half years. Stands before the Lord of all, all the earth. And if you want to go there, he did not die. Amen? Now, one of, the, one of the other clues I wanted to hit on, and I'm just going to run through it real quick, just so you know. And, uh, and last week, it was talking about those. Well, how did they take care of their enemy? It said, fire proceeds out of their mouth to devour their enemies. Anybody that would try to hurt them, fire come out of their mouth. Now, I, I would just imagine if local Channel 5 broadcast news, this is what's happened in Israel. Look at this. These guys are prophesying and fire's coming out of their mouth and everybody that's trying to come against them, they just get burned up. That would be pretty exciting for me, I think. I would hope that'd be pretty exciting for you. It's like, whoa, whoa, here we go, here we go, here we go. Now, now, now we got about three and a half years here. <laughs> Whatever. You know, what, what, what would the world think? And I, thought, I said that last week. What would the world think about this guy or these two guys <laughs> that said it's not going to rain for three and a half years? Oh, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. A month later, there ain't been no rain. And the farmers are sweating. And the world is sweating. And, boy, it's getting hot because there ain't been no rain. And there ain't no crops, there ain't no been no rain. There ain't no food because there ain't been no rain. And it's all your fault. I, I'm guessing not, they don't like those guys. The, pe the people that it says the fire proceeds out of their mouth. In, in 2 Samuel 22, 9, fire proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right? In Job 41, 19, Leviathan. You know Leviathan? It, said, it says, can, he, God says to Job, can you put a hook in his mouth? And it's describing this amazing creature. Was it, well, that, that sounds like a dragon to me. You know, that's what the, the way before the word, you know, the word dinosaur is only, what, 120 some years old. But before it was called a dinosaur, it was called a, a dragon, right? So Leviathan in Job 41, 19 says fire proceeds out of, out of his mouth. In uh, Psalm 18, 8, David says again that fire proceeds out of the mouth of God. And uh, we see that in Revelation 9, the, the army of locusts that turn into horsemen, it says fire proceeds out of fire and brimstone proceed out of their mouth. Revelation 11:5 talks about the two witnesses that fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And I want you to turn to Jeremiah 5, verse 14. Jeremiah 5, verse 14. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you will speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. And these people would, and it shall devour them. God speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, that my word is going to be in your mouth like fire, and when you speak it, it will devour those people. Does that kind of sound similar to what we're looking at as the two witnesses? Can you imagine the wood? You. God putting his word in your mouth and as you, like say, I, I'm going to read this verse. And as I read this verse, anybody that's in my enemy is going to just disintegrate it like a Star Trek phaser or something. Imagine saying God's word and the enemies turn to stubble and falling down. Now I, I think that, now do, do I think that Jeremiah is one of these guys? No, I, I don't think so. You may think so. It's okay if you think that. You know why? Because it doesn't say in Revelation 11, one of these witnesses is Jeremiah. One of these witnesses is, is Moses. One of these is Elijah. It doesn't say that. But you can, with the, the brain God give you and the wisdom God give you and discernment through the Holy Spirit of God, go and put all these clues together and say, hey, could it be? Possibly could it be? And if it just causes you to get in your Bible one more time and study, then mission accomplished. Amen? Who are the two witnesses of God? Ah! <laughs> if you want to sit down and we have a bit of bigger conversation about it, we may land at, at where I think. But I'm not going to say I, I would love for y'all to just chew on that bone, that meat bone, until there ain't nothing, no more meat on the bone. 
and just study and study and study. And then come up to me and say, hey, you know what I found? Maybe you see something that I would never find. Maybe God shows you things that I would never see. That's why it's really important that we study the Bible together. That's what happened Wednesday morning. Somebody sees things, I didn't see that. I'm glad you saw that. That means you're studying. That means God's working in your brain. Study and show yourself approved. The workman that needs not, not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. It's your, it's your responsibility not to just leave it blank words on a page, but be, be involved and be engulfed with it. Let it immerse you. Amen? It's good. So I hope, hope maybe you saw something. And I hope maybe you're just drawn a little bit closer to Jesus. Just a little bit closer. You know, you know we're a day closer to Jesus' second coming than what he was yesterday, right? Amen. Amen. None of us have a guarantee that we're going to make it through today, do we? Right. We can go out here and head to lunch and go meet our Jesus. Amen. Amen. What a glorious day that would be. So Paul, Paul says, he said, I'd rather be here, there than here, but for your sakes, I'm still here. And I, I kind of think, if you're still here, then God's got more work for you to do. Amen? And as Arlene says, get on with it. <laughs> Figure out what it is and get on with it. I'll never forget that in my life. It, it was profound. Well, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God bless you all.